Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to lecture guide number five on Edward Manet and the Impressionist painters. Um, today we're moving into the realm of modern art. Um, and to preface this, I think a lot of people think that modern art is synonymous with uh, abstraction in the realm of painting and sculpture. And in a lot of ways it is, but we want to start back a little bit further and talk about modernism as a historical kind of movement or a historical time period, and then talk more specifically about how some of the concerns that were um, at issue among not only visual artists, but also philosophers and uh, architects, and frankly, in the wider realm of society, became concerns of the painters. So before we even go into Edward Manet as one of the kind of forefathers of modernist painting, what I'd like to do is just kind of sketch very briefly what some of the concerns of modernism were, which rose kind of at the same time as the Industrial Revolution and certainly predate the painters and sculptors that we'll be looking at over the last part of this quarter. So modernism in general is uh, an interest among many different disciplines of the humanities in trying to determine um, what components of past forms of cultural investigation and representation are important for the current modernist moment. In other words, one, if you're a modernist, you start thinking about um, what traditions you've inherited from the past and your various uh, you know, realms of uh, cultural inquiry. And, and let's just talk about painting here. What in painting uh, that you've inherited from the past is still relevant and important to the present moment? Now, if you're a classicist, which is not modernism at all, what your belief is, is that traditional forms of artistry, these kinds of recurrences of classical traditions in the golden ages of art, are good for the present moment because they represent universal, timeless human values and aspirations and aesthetic philosophies that shouldn't change dependent upon the historical situation of the present moment. A modernist, however, would say, well, let's look at the classical tradition and classical forms of painting, and let's determine which of those conventions and traditions are relevant to the contemporary moment. When it comes to something like painting, um, and this is at in a kind of broad way, uh, you know, applies to all of the, the types of modernist movements, whether it be poetry or architecture or philosophy even, um, one of the things you do is you kind of intensify your critical approach to the art of the past, right? So you're looking at very carefully all the things you've inherited from past artistic movements, and you're saying, which of these things are important to the present? Within painting, one of the first things that occurs to a lot of painters, because photography had been under development since, I mean, basically the 1830s and is really a viable medium since the 1850s, is a question about what your medium of artistic uh, expression or representation um, it can do that no other art form can do. Um, what are the strengths and limitations of painting or sculpture? What does it not share in common with other artistic forms such as philosophy or what have you? Um, and you start thinking about, you know, what can my art form do better than anything else? And what are some of the things that, for instance, painting has been trying to do in the classical tradition that it's not really good at, or, or maybe a better way to put this is what other artistic forms can do it better than painting? So this then leads to the question of what is the, the kind of logic or um, essence of painting? What are its strengths and limitations? And what does painting not share with anything else? So I brought up photography just a moment ago to say something like, you know, if photography is around, one of the things that photography is particularly good at is representing the way the world actually looks, right? You can do it 
really accurately, very quickly, without very much artistic intervention. You just, you know, point the camera and, and push the, you know, push the button and you've got a picture of the world around you. Now, you know, of course, classicism kind of tries to accurately represent the world around them, but it tries to idealize it. Um, but if you're a modernist painter, you're saying something like, especially early on, listen, why am I trying to copy the way the world looks when another artistic form does it better? Or another way to put this is, why am I trying to create an illusion of the world in which we all live if, for instance, you can go out into that world and see it firsthand, which is the best way to do it, or you can look at a photograph of it, which does it much more efficiently than painting, uh, or frankly, you could create a sculpture of it and get a 3D space um, generated by sculpture. Why should painting try to create illusions? <clears throat> so a lot of painters, including Edouard Manet, who's right at the beginning of this you know, set of questions that modernist artists are beginning to raise about the essence of the medium, what it doesn't share with other mediums and so forth, would say, yeah, you're right. Why am I trying to make um, my painting look like an illusion of an actual 3D world in which we all live? Now for Edward Manet, who's right at the beginning of this, you know, kind of movement within painting, his approach is to say something like, along with being able to represent through a painting something that looks fairly realistic or naturalistic to the world around us, I also want to draw attention to the medium properties or the kind of physical properties of paint itself. Because if you've ever seen a painting before, sometimes we marvel over how skillfully it represents illusions. But some of us know that painting, when you look at it closely and you're looking at the brush stroke and the colors that are chosen and the textures that the artists have been choosing, that all of those extra components, properties of the physical you know, medium of painting are equally aesthetically appealing just in terms of design. Like, I really like that texture. I really like that color. And Edouard Manet is going to be interested in those types of things. Or again, another way to put it is, if Edward Manet comes into, the, the, into painting and says, why would I ever try to create an illusion of painting if, or an illusion of an actual scene through painting if photography does it better or sculpture could do it better, you could just walk outside and see it. Maybe painting at its essence, at its core, is more about the materiality of paint on a surface than it is about creating an illusion. The other thing that modernist painters and artists in general are interested in is modern subject matter. So instead of looking like a classicist would at traditions that are drawn out of Greek and Roman um, mythology or Christian religion or famous battle scenes or what have you that don't have anything to do perhaps directly with the contemporary moment, most of the subject matter of someone like Edward Manet and the Impressionist is taken from the very world in which they live. And in this way, they are continuing, these modernist painters, ideas that were first, at least in our course, brought up by romantic painters, right? They're painting scenes of the contemporary world in which they live. Uh, and then later on by the realist painters. The final thing that a lot of modernist painting has, uh, you know, as its interest, at least in this first lecture, we want to look at this, is just like Romanticism, a lot of times the contemporary subject matter that uh, a modern artist will use in their works of art is meant to give us some kind of insight on the social relations or various things going on in their world um, directly. They want to make commentary on this, and we'll bring that up as we go along. So then let's go directly into Edward Manet's work. And we're thinking of Edward Manet in this lecture as one of the first of the modernist painters who's interested in these modern ideas about, you know, being hypercritical about what you derive from traditional forms of painting, carefully sorting through what you've inherited from the past to ask questions about whether it's relevant in the contemporary moment asking questions about what your medium does better than any other medium and what its essence or kind of basic qualities might be that set it apart from anything else. 
and then making critical commentary on the world in which you live. So you'll remember last time when we were talking about realist painting, we were looking at uh, Courbet's work and we looked at his work from 1855 called um, The Studio of the Artist, a real allegory summarizing my seven years as an artist. And what I said about that work, there are two major things is that, that are important here because Edouard Manet was a huge um, admirer of Courbet's work is that Corbet was pointing out that his subject matter came from everyday life, the world in which he lived. And then the second important thing here is that Corbet started to fight against the French Royal Academy, um, believing that they, were, they had a kind of stranglehold on artistry and would only allow artists or particular works into their grand exhibitions, the salons that conformed with the aesthetic philosophy uh, and the look of classical paintings, even if every once in a while you'd make a token exception for some new popular art form such as Courbet's. And because he couldn't get the works exhibited in the 1855 Salon slash Paris Universal Exposition, remember, he established his own first alternative venue for the exhibition of modernist painting in the Realist Pavilion that was held in that same year and funded by Alfred Bruyas. The reason that's important here is that the work that you're looking at on the screen, which might strike all of you as a little bit weird, right? We've got a couple of dressed people and they're dressed in the clothes of kind of contemporary Parisians, probably schoolboys attending the university, the famous Paris Sorbonne University, hanging out in what looks like a Parisian park with a picnic. And one of the women is nude and the other is kind of back in the water in a, you know, in her bed clothes or her undergarments as well. And you, you know, it seems like pretty risque at best. Well, in 1863, when Edward Manet painted this, he wanted to have this work exhibited in the exhibition of the French Royal Academy, the Salon. And he submitted it as so many other artists did who were also interested in modernism and it was not accepted. They refused it on the grounds that it didn't conform to classical aesthetic principles. So you might think, well, the game's over there. Where is he going to show this work if the biggest, probably only important exhibition venue in town is not going to accept his work? And see, that's why this is a problem for modern artists who are breaking with the traditions. They don't have an alternative to the French Royal Academy. Well, in 1863, so many works of art were refused for exhibition in the Grand Salon that the leader of France of the time, now Napoleon III of the Second Empire of France, decided that what he would do, and it was a kind of populist move to placate the masses, would be to hold an alternative exhibition to the arts outside of the French Royal Academy which he called the Salon of the Refused, or the Salon des Refusés. And in this work, all artists who were not uh, admitted to the Salon were invited to show their works in this alternative exhibition. It was a kind of brilliant move on the part of Napoleon III. On the one hand, he's saying, no, 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 we're not, we don't have a stranglehold on what is great art in the Royal Academy. See, I will give an alternative venue to artists to show their works. But on the other hand, there was kind of nothing for him to lose because he fully expected, and he was right, that the public would go and look at this work and be kind of flabbergasted by how bad it was or how it didn't follow the conventions of art and would d dismiss it, and rightly so, conforming to the ideas of classicism. So Edward Manet showed this work, <clears throat> and this was the work that was the most controversial in this entire show of refused art from the Grand Salon. The work is called Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass. And the reason that the critics were so harsh on this really doesn't have a ton to do with the risque subject matter. You might think that they would say, well, this is inappropriate. We've talked about the sexual innuendo of the female nude and how that's carefully, carefully kind of covered by various stories or various conventions of art to make it okay. But here, those conventions aren't around. It's contemporary schoolboys hanging out in a, a park with nude women or uh, one nude woman and another scantily clad woman. And 
according to kind of the social mores of the time, that's why the critics would have a problem with this. But that wasn't the big concern. They probably did have a problem with this, but the big concern was with the way that it was painted. And I'll show you close-ups of this in a moment. But for the critics, the painting style of this, when you get close to it, is really sketchy. It doesn't look like it's been finished up. A classical artist might start with something that looks a little bit like this, but they would keep layering layer after layer of oil glazes over it until it became hyper-realistic or idealistic, and Manet hasn't done that. And the reason that he didn't do that is that he wanted his painting to be understood on the one hand as a representation of real things in the world, a landscape, figures in conversation, what is known as a still life, meaning fruits and flowers, which are part of that uh, kind of picnic in the front left foreground. But he also wanted this to be read as paint applied to a canvas. He didn't want to hide that fact. He wanted people to take pleasure in just the properties of paint, this color and that color and this type of texture against that kind of texture and so forth, without, you know, just thinking about this as an illusion of a 3D space. So then let's, we'll, we'll get to that. I'll show you close-ups of that, but let's talk a little bit about where the subject matter came from in the first place. Because the trick to this painting, frankly, is that Manet has taken various subjects from past works of art or various compositional structures from very well-known works of art and he's put them into this painting, and then he has painted all those very traditional subjects, for instance, the female nude, or figures in conversation, or a landscape painting, or a still life painting. He's put those all together as a compendium, and then he's painted them in this new modernist style. So up close, when you look at the central figure here, the nude, notice how, um, and it's hard to see so much in a slide, that she looks kind of flat, right? She doesn't have all of what we call the half tones that would give a smoothly modeled form that really was convincingly three-dimensional. She's just painted with a little bit of dark on the edges of her arms and then just kind of a broad plane of white. Um, it doesn't really convincingly look 3D. Excuse me, let me go back uh, for a minute and pause. Sorry about that. Uh, and then the subject matter itself, the precedent for Manet's subject matter actually comes out of the history of art. He was very much caught up with and interested in the Venetian painters that were hanging in the Louvre, uh, which is the big museum in Paris at the time, and seems to have taken some inspiration from this famous work by Titian. Notice Fetch on Petra, you don't need to remember this, but where you have something kind of similar, you have two guys in conversation and a couple of nude figures around them. And those nude figures are actually supposed to represent the men's inspiration for the production of beautiful music. Or the compositional grouping if you look over to the right hand side, this is an etching after a famous Raphael Sanzio work in which he's taken this compositional format of these figures, follow my cursor, over on the right hand side uh, and applied it to his own work itself. Now what he's doing there is that again, he's quoting past works of art, past conventions, um, past usages of nude forms or tropes of inspiration, but he's painting this all now in a modern style. Or a simple summary of this is that Edward Manet has grouped together very traditional genres of painting, landscape painting, figures in groups, nudes, still lives, but he's painted them in this new modern mode that draws attention to the material properties of paint. This, for instance, is a close-up of the surface of the painting looking at that, that kind of picnic basket or still life in the foreground where you can see very clearly the brush strokes and the textures and so forth. It's not that he doesn't have the skill to finish this up and make it look hyper-realistic. It's that he wants you to enjoy these passages of paint. During the time 
This was called preserving the integrity of the picture plane. Remember that picture plane is that imaginary kind of window that separates you from the scene of the painting. Uh, and here, that imaginary window that separates you from the scene of the painting kind of dissolves or goes away because the surface of the painting asserts itself. There is no kind of hyper illusion. You see that surface of the painting and all its material properties and either you like that kind of design element or you don't. But for Manet and a lot of the um, early modernist painters, this is a way of drawing attention to one of the things that painting has going for it that that photography doesn't uh, and that the real world frankly doesn't and that's the ability to take pleasure in the physicality or material properties of paint itself. If you've ever, for instance, looked at just an abstract design and thought, oh, I really like that. It doesn't represent anything necessarily, but I like those colors and I like those textures. I like that kind of shape next to that shape. That's what he's going for. Now in the same year, he painted this work and it's maybe the most famous kind of um, critique of the tradition of the female nude that was produced in the 19th century. He painted it in 1863. It's called Olympia, but it wasn't exhibited until two years later where he exhibited it in the grand exhibitions of the Royal Academy, right alongside all of the other very typical female nudes, including that Alexander Cabanel work that I've shown you before. <clears throat> and I'll bring that up again here. What I'd like you to think about here is all the different ways that he has inverted or turned on its head some of the presumptions of the female nude. So let's talk first of all about what you're actually looking at here. It looks similar to a, an Ang work, uh, the Grand Odalisque for instance, and in particular he is quoting a work by Titian again, the so-called Venus of Urbino that I will um, show you uh, in a comparison here in a moment. But he is painting it in that very flat, very painterly style with what we call loose brush strokes where you can see every brush stroke on there. He's preserving the integrity of the picture plane. It's very painterly in its quality. It draws attention to the way that it's painted. But even more than that, the subject matter is essential to this. Olympia refers to a famous play by Alexander Dumas that was going around town at the time. We don't need to go into the specifics of that, but the term Olympia refers to a prostitute. So here, instead of giving this the title of a lofty Venus, you know, um, which would associate it with the long tradition of classicism, he's saying, here is a prostitute in front of you. And once you know that story, and it's a play off the idea of the Olympian gods living on Olympus, like Venus li lived on Olympus, the, the mountain in Greece and so forth. Um, once you know that, the entire kind of um, viewer dynamic that we've talked about, it changes dramatically. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at these two in comparison to one another. On the bottom is Titian's Venus of Urbino which clearly Manet is quoting, but then changing in some pretty important ways. On the bottom work, she's called the Venus, and you are set up as the presumed heterosexual male viewer who is getting this kind of coy look, uh, kind of come hither look to you. It's a, a typical male fantasy scene uh, in which you get to take pleasure in looking at a nude figure who will never confront you in return, right? You're set up as a voyeur. Whereas on the top, instead of being the perfect lover who's entered into the scene, you are the lowly John who couldn't get it anywhere else and are having to pay for it. In this scene, I'm going to back up here for a minute. In this scene, you have brought her flowers. Those are the flowers that are being held by her servant in the background, still wrapped in their, their paper, which for a French person would be a kind of empty gesture. You didn't even bother to take them out of the paper. They were wrapped in when you bought them and put them in a vase. Um, you're just kind of doing it very quickly. So an empty gesture. You've given her those flowers and she's giving you a look that is straight on. It looks right back at you and it's not, I mean, however you want to interpret this, it's not that kind of come hither, you're the greatest guy in the world look. It seems at least mildly confrontational. So right off the bat, 
something is being critiqued in the tradition of the female nude here. And that critique, this is key, and a lot of modern artists will do it, is a way of investigating how the long tradition of classical nudes worked by inverting it. In other words, in Manet's work, you stand in front of it. Now you're the lowly John. The person that you're paying for sex doesn't seem all that excited to see you. You're no longer a voyeur in this scene. You're implicated in the scene and you feel kind of crummy about yourself in that you're paying for it and she doesn't even give you, uh, you know, a fake, um, you're, you're the greatest guy in the world look. Why do I bring that up here? Because if you think about this, um, and then you think about the entire tradition of the female nude, all those nudes we've seen before, you might be left with this kind of critical commentary coming from Manet. And that's that the long tradition of the female nude is really set up so as to make men feel comfortable in the face of someone that they desire, where that doesn't usually happen in everyday life. Um, just stop and think, you don't need to be a man, you can be a woman too. If you've ever been around someone that you found incredibly attractive, you'll know that, you know, you get a little bit anxious, you may feel tongue-tied, you don't feel particularly comfortable. None of that happens in front of the long classical tradition of the female nude, where you're the voyeur, where the look she returns to you is one that is always happy and returns your sense of desire. That's all been complicated here, and it makes you think back. It's like a critical commentary on the female nude of the past saying, listen, that female nude was around so as to make you feel comfortable. This one doesn't make you feel comfortable. Now let's go through it piece by piece. Now he's clearly taking parts of um, Titian's Venus of Urbino and redoing it. So if you look at these two together, for instance, we, we talked about the difference of the look, but let's talk about the difference of the pose. Manet's Olympia is very stiff. She doesn't look comfortable. The one on the bottom, Titian's Venus of Urbino, looks completely at ease. Manet's Olympia's hand puts her hand kind of clamped down over her you know, crotch region, as if to say, no, you don't get to see this or do anything with this until I say so. Whereas Titian's Venus of Urbino, that hand's kind of lingering down there, um, but it's not entirely clear what it's doing. I mean, people have even surmised that it might she might be pleasuring herself. In Venus of Urbino down below, you see a little happy dog down here sleeping away, comfortable lap dog, who is a symbol of fidelity or loyalty. Up above in Manet's Olympia, you see a black cat who's arched its back and is kind of hissing at you as if to be a kind of external manifestation of the psyche of the seated nude or the lying nude. In other words, saying she's not comfortable with this at all. And you can keep going on with that. Um, Manny's Olympia, if you look at it up close, what she's wearing are all accoutrements that are meant to make her look um, like this is a, a grand sexual kind of encounter, but it's all fake. The flower in her hair is a paper flower that she puts on just for this occasion. Her jewelry is very cheap costume jewelry. The satin that she has on the bed is supposed to evoke the oriental tradition of those kinds of fantasy pictures. All of that is in here so as to tell you that what you're in the middle of is a theatrical production, totally fake, to make you feel comfortable, but she's not really pulling it off. And then finally, when it comes to the style or the way this is painted, it's really flat and sketchy because once again, he wants to assert the material properties of paint. Manny is interested in all these types of social commentaries in his work. It's what, uh, in general, and you will have read about this in your readings, we call, um, well, artists, especially male artists, female artists didn't weren't allowed to kind of go out in public and do this. But male artists of the modernist moment oftentimes play what we call the role of the flaneur. A flaneur, for lack of a better way to put it, is someone who feels slightly detached from society um, and walks around the world noticing all the changes in the modern world in which they lived, 
um, and makes comments on those changes. Remember what's going on in the world. You absolutely should have done your reading and your reserved reading. There's this mass uh, renovation of Paris. And part of that renovation, as I said last week, was the gentrification of Paris. And on the one hand, this meant that a lot of people of lower classes got pushed out of Paris because they couldn't afford it, while the upper class people were able to afford it now and build grand new uh, apartments and houses and start their businesses and so forth. The other thing, though, going on at the same time period is that the lower classes need a place to work. So they're all flocking to Paris and are very easy to see around Paris, interacting with those who can live in Paris proper and, and be owners of business. Third, of course, there's this new interest in the 19th century about social stratification or the class system that adheres in even our contemporary world. For instance, Marx and Engels writing the Communist Manifesto talking about the plight of the lower classes. So this is on a lot of people's minds, like looking at the new social ramifications of the world system in which they live, and modernist painters are interested in looking at this. A flanner then is kind of like an amateur sociologist or a glorified people watcher wandering through the world in which they live, which is rapidly changing, noticing changes in that world and trying to make commentary on that. The final thing that's of interest, I think, over and again in both Manet's work and in certain Impressionist works is that the lower classes now could go to stores, and by lower classes, I mean lower middle class and such, could go to new department stores and buy knockoff clothing that made them look like they were of a social standing above them. And you'll oftentimes see artists making reference to these kinds of knockoff department store clothes. By the way, those department stores were called the Bon Marché, the cheap uh, market, or the good market. So here we see a work that is called The Plum by Edward Manet. And on its surface, the subject matter is a woman sitting in a bar, smoking a cigarette, kind of looking off into space, lost daydreaming, while sitting in front of her is a plum that's been soaked in brandy. But the second level, where we started off this class, what we call iconography, is that the woman is clearly dressed in cheap clothing, coming from the lower middle classes. She is eating this plum soaked with brandy that's going to give her a heavy buzz and smoking, which everyone did, but it's filled with sexual innuendo, like all of those film noir movies, if you've seen those, in the middle of the day. It's not even late at night. So she's trying to get her buzz on or trying to get a drink um, while still getting a little bit of nourishment from the plum in the middle of the day. But the key feature to this whole thing is her look. She's daydreaming or lost, uh, you know, looking off into kind of an indeterminate space. This is what the French call ennui, and it's a term that we've borrowed here in English language too, which comes from the French ennui is for boredom, but ennui specifically means, and it's E-N-N-U-I is the term, specifically means a kind of social alienation. In other words, this woman, her look, or what the French call le regard, the look, is one in which she feels alienated from the world around her. She will never participate in a middle-class world or an upper-class world that's closed to her. As a matter of fact, most people would have surmised that this woman is a prostitute. She's one of the very many women who and frankly men as well, who flocked to Paris in order to get a new life, only to find that um, you know, because of the economic circumstances, she would be tending bar for tips or working as a housemaid or, as was often the case for women, prostituting herself just to get by. Part of the, um, so this work is basically about those people that this new modern age is, um, is passing by, that they'll never kind of get what they want out of this world, that they're stuck in realms like prostitution and getting drunk during the middle of the day so as to escape from that world and so forth. 
The final big device that I want to tell you about, uh, obviously this is all painted very sketchily, all those things that I talked about when it came to Manet's modernism and drawing attention to the material properties of paint are still um, here to be seen. But this becomes really common. You see this table in front of her, running across her and separating us from her. A lot of modern artists will use this to evoke the thematic of social alienation, that she can't participate in the world outside her, that there is a barrier between her and the world outside her. And Manet, like so many others, shows you her waist or her um, kind of, you know, well, her crotch region to say the one place that she participates in the middle class is by prostituting herself and maybe getting the fantasy that one of these men who is paying her for sex will one day marry her or what have you. The most famous of all these kinds of social commentaries is perhaps a later work by Edouard Manet called The Bar at the Folie Bergère. And the Bar at the Folie Bergère, its subject matter, is one of those bars that cropped up all over Paris starting in the mid-century and really got going in the 1880s, such as the Moulin Rouge might be the one that you recognize, which were places that the upper middle class would go, um, you know, during the weekend to enjoy entertainment, to flirt with other people, to enjoy their mi middle class leisurely lives. See, this is another component of the 19th century that a lot of the Impressionist painters in particular focus on and other works by Manet focus on this as well. That's that during this time period of the 19th century, the middle class um, had enough money that they didn't need to work all the time. They didn't need to worry about whether they were going to be able, be able to pay rent or what have you. They had a ton of extra kind of downtime and time to go out and entertain themselves. And so various new forms of, um, you know, venues for entertainment cropped up, such as this place, where at the Folie Bergère, by the way, you could go and you could watch women dancing on stage and fairly kind of risque dances, such as the Can Can. Um, you could see um, circus kind of um, performers up in the far left hand corner, if you follow my cursor. You see uh, two legs on a trapeze. This is a, you know, showing something that would have happened at the Folie Bergère. People will go there to be entertained and have fun. But the subject of this work even more particularly is the woman who we're looking at here straight on. She is a barmaid who has probably, she's probably one of those many women who flock to Paris in order to um, get a new life for herself only to find out, you know, there were no jobs for her um, because of her social standing. She couldn't get a good marriage and she ends up tending bar where during this time you tended bar just for tips, right? So you're beholden to your clientele. You had to kind of flirt with them. You had to be nice to them. I'm sure at least a few of you have worked in the service industry before where you know the customer is always right. And particularly when you're attending bar or working at a wait as a waitress or something of that sort, in order to get a good tip, you have to be nice to the people around you. That's, you know, the only way that she's going to get by. Behind her is a mirror. That's what you're looking at here behind her. It's a mirror behind the bar that reflects the scene outside of her in our space as the viewer of all the middle, middle class really enjoying themselves and including very prominently this woman who's kind of you know, much more illuminated here, part of the middle class, you know, enjoying the scene of the world around her. She is separated from that scene by the bar itself. And you see that look on her face that looks kind of sad, right? I will never participate in this world that I came to Paris to be a part of. Now on the bar in front of her, are all these things that of course anyone could have got um, that are forms of pleasure, right? Champagne, it's even Bass Ale, which is still around today on both sides. Creme de menthe over here, tangerines, um, you know, anything that will give you pleasure, um, enjoyable cocktails and fruits and so forth. And just like those things, she um, is a form of your pleasure. And that's part of the hidden message of this work. Notice how she has a dark bodice on and a kind of golden hair here 
that rhymes with the shape of the champagne over here with gold on top and a dark down below. Or how the tangerine color here is also picked up in the flowers that are at her chest. This is to rhyme her with these consumer items on in the foreground, what we call fetishes, right? What we call things that objects that give you pleasure. And she is another fetish. She is something that you can purchase here. That's the hidden innuendo. And the way that it comes about is behind her, slightly distorted is in the mirror, a reflection of her from the back with a man who stands basically in our viewer space in front of her. And the key to this work is the differences between what we see as a viewer and what we see in the mirror over here and her interaction with the man. See, the thing is, in the mirror reflection, she is kind of insubstantial. In the mirror image, um, she is much closer to the person who is in front of her, appears closer to the person in front of her, and almost seems to lean into him. There's nothing to suggest she's unhappy in the mirror. She's playing the game that she is supposed to play by flirting with this man who has probably just dropped off these flowers that you see here in the foreground as his kind of, you know, entry move. Here are these flowers, a flower for, for a beautiful woman like you. And in the mirror, you see her acting the way she probably would in everyday life so as to ensure her tips or frankly, if she's in a difficult situation to get a date where she could get paid for sex. However, we get to see what Manet probably saw night after night by watching these women when he went to these bars. He gets to see the psychic impact that it has on her and we do as well. Because where we are is in the same place as the man in the top hat in the mirror. But the look that we see is the distress our flirtation causes her. After all, these women get hit on night after night. No one's being chivalrous about this. They're taking what they want from her. But in the mirror, we get to see the impact on her. And that's his social commentary. In the foreground, just to show you these things, everything is painted in that very sketchy mode so as to draw your attention to the material properties of paint along with this commentary. I'm gonna pause here for two seconds. I'll be right back. So, Edouard Manet kind of starts the ball rolling towards modernism, or at least that's the way art history treats him as a figure. And of course, his circle of friends uh, were people who will later be known as the Impressionist painters. Now, Impressionism is a little bit different, although some of its characteristics um, are, are shared by Manet. Um, we're looking here at a work by uh, Claude Monet. Um, again, this is tricky for early students of art history. Think Manet as coming first, A comes before O, and Monet coming second. And the work you're looking at here on the screen is a work called Impression Sunrise from 1872 that really gives Impressionism its name. Impressionism has basically two different thrusts to it when it comes to their goals. Um, sometimes they're, you know, the same painter will have both of these together. Sometimes they emphasize one over the other. Claude Monet represents the side of Impressionism that on the one hand is very modernist. And you can see this here, right? It, it doesn't really look like an accurate representation of a scene. Um, it, it really draws attention to the brush strokes on the surface of the canvas. And so it emphasizes the material properties of paint. But along with that, and this is the key first goal of some Impressionists, it tries to capture to some degree the way that our eye perceives the world rather than the way that our mind understands the world. If you have ever stopped um, to actually look at what you're seeing when you see a landscape, for instance, what you're really seeing, what your retina is registering is light effects. And those light effects change dramatically depending on the atmospheric conditions of the day, the light and darkness of the day, they fluctuate wildly. 
Now these artists come out of the tradition to some degree of those early naturalist Barbizon school painters who are going out into nature and painting en plein air in the full air and trying to capture what they actually see. But this is one step further than that, right? The way that the eye works, for those of you who don't know or want to refresh on this, is that we're constantly receiving information in our eye and it's all light spectrum information. That's all that we're, our eye is actually registering, different light spectrums, right? So different colors and so forth. That information that our retina receives is huge. It's about 100 million pieces of information in the light spectrum every given moment. But because we're very efficient creatures, um, when that information that is registered on the retina is sent down the optical nerve to the visual cortex, it refines that or basically kind of filters it. And so that 100 million pieces of information immediately gets kind of cut down to about 5 million pieces of information. And then our brain in the process of interpretation, which doesn't really want to deal with 5 million pieces of information, just says, for instance, in front of this painting, it's some people in a boat, it's a water scene, there's a sunrise in the background, there's clouds, whatever, and turns it into an idea or a concept. This is what this is. Now what the Impressionist painters, or at least one goal of the Impressionist painters was, is to capture the effects of light on the retina before the eye turns it into something, or before the mind turns it into something else. And this famous quote that I give you, gave you on your lecture guide by Monet is meant to draw your attention to this. See, Monet once said, frankly, he wished he had been born blind and later had learned how to see so that he could paint according to his naive eye, what the eye actually sees rather than what the mind knows. Or in this quote, he said, when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, a tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think, here is a little square of blue, Here's an oblong of pink, here's a streak of yellow, and paint it just as it seems to you, the exact color and shape, until it gives your own naive impression of the scene before you. In this way, they are, um, these Impressionist painters are really trying to do something that has to do with truth. They want to paint the way that the world actually looks to your eye rather than what your mind turns it into. And that's what Monet in particular was really interested in other Impressionists as well. So here what you're seeing is a scene, as I said before, that on the one hand is the way that his eye sees uh, in a sunrise over a water scene before his mind turns it into something else. And on the other hand, it is very closely tied to modernist ideas about painting. Remember, photography is out there at this point. Most of these Impressionist painters actually fooled around a little bit with taking their own photographs. Um, and so why try to do what photography can do way better than you can do it? Do something else. And in this case, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, the effect of light on the surface of the water, just follow my cursor here, makes it look like these little streaks of orangish red, which are the exact same as if I put an orange streak of uh, orangish red streak of paint across the surface of the canvas. In other words, there's a direct correlation between the brush stroke and how the eye registers the scene itself. Now the other thing you need to know about the Impressionist painters is that they're not showing in the Royal Academy. They established the first long-running alternative exhibition venue for painting and sculpture and frankly prints and even photography. Over the course of about 12 years, they hold exhibitions between 1874 and 1886, inviting people who weren't interested in playing the classical game in the Royal Academy to show their works and sell their works there. To kind of draw out this one first major emphasis of Impressionism, think about this. These are Ed, um, Claude Monet's Haystack series. On the left-hand side, you see a photograph of a haystack, right? It looks like photographs do, very sharp, very realistic. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but 
the picture you take with a camera, even though we believe it to be exactly what's in front of our eye, actually changes what our eye sees because it stops time, it freezes time at one moment, uh, and it frankly distorts it according to its lens. On the right hand side is a haystack as Monet saw it during a very particular time of year in particular light conditions that gives it all these pinks and even greens and light blues and so forth. And I'll just show you a series of these haystacks so as to kind of draw this out. It's the same haystack basically seen at different types of year in different lighting conditions that change of course the way that that haystack actually looks to our eye. Now a classicist would say something like, why paint the fluctuations of how a haystack looks at different times of the year? Paint the ideal form of the haystack, but Monet and the Impressionists are interested in the specific look of a haystack during specific times of a year in specific lighting conditions. Or this series of works by Monet, the Rouen Cathedral, which is a cathedral in France in the city of Rouen. It's the same scene painted from exactly the same vantage point over and over again f during different times of the year in different lighting conditions. And of course, that surface looks quite different depending on what the lighting conditions are. Now the other side of Impressionism kind of came out of the long tradition of Romanticism and Realism and also Edouard Manet's interest in playing the role of the flaneur and making social commentary. And I use a few works by this man, Gustav Kaibot, who was another Impressionist painter, to emphasize this idea. What you're looking at here is a painting called Le Pont l'Europe, or The Bridge of Europe. And in this scene, you're set up as if you're wandering across this newly formed bridge, part of the renovation of Paris, and looking at the various kind of social interactions, what's going on in the scene, and hopefully, at least for uh, Kaibot, thinking about, you know, how the world has changed and what these changes mean. First of all, the bridge itself was the newest bridge in Paris at this time, and it's constructed in a very particular modernist architectural or engineering style. What I mean by that is that it doesn't try to cover up the way that it is engineered. It uses these steel beams with big rivets and bolts holding it all together, and it doesn't try to cover that up. That's part of the modernist aesthetic. As a matter of fact, one of my best examples of kind of this idea of each art form trying to determine what is essential to itself under modernism is modern architecture. So the Eiffel Tower, for instance, which gets started a little after this time period is constructed much the same way. And at the time it was constructed, just all those steel I-beams kind of building the form up was pretty controversial because a lot of people thought, no, that's ugly, right? That steel is ugly. But the modernist architect and engineer of these works would say, no, there is beauty in drawing attention to the materials from which this is built. Um, the way that it's constructed is its own aesthetic. Let's just let that stand on its own. So in this work, the bridge itself is a big emblem of modernist tendencies in the arts. Then you start looking at the characters here. It's like we're following this dog in the foreground. Um, and dogs are, of course, curious, walking through the world, sniffing things. We're kind of like that. What do we find? Well, the first figure we find is a, a younger man dressed in clothes uh, of a university student. And we have to wonder, what does he make of all these changes in the world coming from a younger generation? If we follow the banister down, we'll see an older man, um, you know, dressed in work clothes. He's of an older generation of a slightly different class. Maybe he never went to university. How does he view this world and its changes? And then, of course, really uh, kind of obviously are, is this couple here. They're the upper middle class, or at least that's one interpretation, on their way to some you know, venue. They're dressed in their fine clothes, and 
interacting in a way in which the man looks like he's kind of turning to it if it is his wife and saying something to her like hurry up or you know get along your ways and and the other interpretation though of this couple is that it's not a couple at all this is a, a middle class man wandering through the world and he's walked by a woman who's dressed in clothes that might be the clothes of a prostitute and is saying something kind of snotty to her in the background are the new buildings that were built during the paris um, renovation second empire style buildings again just emblems of all these changes in the world and lots of little things that are prompting you to think what do all these changes mean my favorite kind of juxtaposition of two different paintings by Gustav Kaibot are these two paintings. On the left is a work that's called The Balcony or Balcony. And on the right is a work that's called Interior Woman at the Window. Now they're basically the same subject matter, right? Two people standing at a window looking out on the scene in front of you. But what Kaibot seems to be trying to do is make a social commentary on male access to the visual realm or the world around them versus women's access to the world around them. I've mentioned before that women weren't really allowed. It's not like it was a law, but it was one of those socially accepted rules. Women weren't allowed to kind of wander around Paris on their own. Uh, and when they were, they were oftentimes um, criticized for this, or people would publicly shame them for breaking you know, ver various so social norms, whereas men could do whatever they want. On let me pause here. The key component of this juxtaposition, as I've set it up, brings out, out another aspect of modernist painting that starts to show up at this time. Right at the beginning of this class, I made mention, and I've continued to kind of try to focus on this, that one of the things that painting can do and, and visual arts can do that, for instance, photography has a tough time with at this time when you couldn't manipulate it much, um, is, and this is part of the essence of its, its art form, is that it can manipulate the way that something looks, it can change the colors and the textures and the composition so as to express an idea through the effects of the formal elements. And I wanna, I wanna kind of model this for you here in this juxtaposition. So for instance, on the left-hand side, what Kaimbot has done is he's given us access to a deep, illusionistic space. This man can see far off into the distance. He has access to all of those things that are in front of him. On the right hand side, the woman's view is occluded. The small Parisian uh, street in which she, um, you know, which she's looking at across is compressed even more. That space is compressed so much that it looks like she doesn't have much visual access to anything out there, just another building in front of her. Whereas on the left-hand side, the balcony is quite low, giving him visual access. On the right-hand side, there is the, uh, the frame of the window and the high banister that kind of gets in our way. We can't see very much. Whereas on the left-hand side, there is no one else in this room with him as a kind of chaperone or someone looking over his shoulder. On the right-hand side, there's a man in this picture sitting in the chair she almost seems kind of pinioned in between the window and him as if her space is really um, kind of claustrophobic. And he is reading a newspaper, which is something men did. Newspapers were oftentimes associated with politics and world events and, uh, and the financial markets. And those were all the realm that men worked in versus women uh, primarily working out of the home. Some other really important ways that Kaibot has manipulated what you see in order to make some assertions about male versus female access to the wider public realm is look at um, you know, the color of the work on the left. It's primarily whites with a little yellow underneath it. And what we know and what painters begin to figure out during this time period is that warm colors, colors on the red, yellow, orange end of the spectrum feel like they are advancing towards us and expanding outwards. Thus, the very colors that he's chosen here expand the space. 
The opposite is true of uh, colors on the cool end of the spectrum and the blue-purple end of the spectrum. And on her side, on the right-hand side, most of the colors here are blues. Even the whites are tinged with blues, which compress and contract and close that space down and even more. On the left-hand side, look at the banister in front of him. They're sturdy um, kind of columns holding it up, a very architectonic rectilinear form of the crossing member there, very closely associated with things that would have been thought of as masculine, sturdy, strong, uh, stable. Where on her side, she is basically framed by lace curtains. The iron banister in front of her is made up of a bunch of kind of curly cues and things that would have been thought of as feminine. So these are ways that the artist has manipulated the scene. Now, whatever that scene originally looked like, he's definitely played around with it so as to make some assertions about the masculine versus the feminine in his own time. He's playing the role of the flaneur. He's changing the way that the scene looked in order to express through the formal elements of color and space and even the shape of these forms, masculine versus feminine conventions of his own time period. Another famous Impressionist painter is Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and he kind of combines these two goals of Impressionism. On the one time, he's very interested in the idea of the light effects of a particular moment of the day and how those cause changes in the way we experience or perceive things. And on the other hand, he is interested in at least a, a moderate level of social commentary. In this work called the Moulin de la Galette, we're looking at a scene of what's known as a cafe concert. It's a little bit like the bar at the Folie Bergère, although in this place, the Moulin de la Galette, they had an outdoor kind of courtyard where the you know people could gather together and enjoy their leisure time and enjoy each other. And that's all he's showing you. He's showing you beautiful young people of the middle classes enjoying their leisure time, dancing, drinking, flirting, having fun. But because it's a cafe concert and it's outside, those hanging lights are actually hung outside, you can also see the way that he has dappled the entire scene with light that is filtering through the trees up above onto these figures to try to capture the way that this light would have affected the scene itself and how it actually looked to his own naive eye. My favorite for playing around with this like a visual soap opera is this work, which is called The Luncheon of the Boating Party. Now, as with many, many Impressionist works, this is based upon an actual event in his own life. And um, you'll hear this a lot. Uh, I think it's a poor form of art history that just tries to kind of look back and, and say what was happening in this actual event and then just forgetting that the artist has changed that event so as to make some kind of social commentary in their painting. Um, the other thing to point out while I'm on this subject is You'll read over and again that we can recognize the figures in these scenes. You know, they're, they're the artist himself here in the foreground. Um, this is him sitting backwards in his chair uh, or friends of his. And then some art historians go and try to figure out who these people are to figure out what the message of the work might be. Um, that sometimes is useful. But more often than not, these Impressionist painters aren't spending great amounts of money on models. Um, you know, instead, they're, they're hitting up their friends to come pose for them so that they can get their work done a little bit more cheaply. They're not getting the same prices for their paintings that their classical artists are, for instance. So with all that being said, let's think of this instead of like as a particular moment that Kaibot experienced as here is his remembrance of that moment and he's trying to make some social commentary on what this leisurely activity of going on a, a boating event and then coming back and having a big lunch and everyone drinking and eating good food and socially interacting. What is he trying to say about that? Well, one of the first things you'll notice if you spend some time looking at this is that while everyone is flirting or interested in something, there's rarely a place, and I can't see a single one, in which someone is 
uh, kind of returning someone else's interest. It's like one person is interested in someone else and that person is interested in someone else and so forth. So for instance, let's start with this grouping here on the, the, uh, on the right hand side. We see someone who's dressed um, in a kind of bohemian style, meaning he's breaking with the social norms. He's taken off his jacket and his shirt because it's a hot day. He's sitting backwards in his chair and he's smoking a cigarette, right? This is the bad boy of the scene. Up above him is a man dressed properly in the clothing of a university student of the middle class. He's wearing his coat, he's wearing his tie and his shirt. And then you see a woman here of the middle class, um, you know, dressed properly. Now the man up above her clearly has interest in her. He's one of those guys that hovers around the girl that he has interest in, but she doesn't seem to be interested in him. She's looking at the bad boy and the bad boy doesn't return her interest. Instead, he seems to be interested in this woman over here who is having some kind of interaction with her dog. And it's so well um, kind of painted that you can probably imagine this, this kind of conversation. She's had a few glasses of wine here. She's picked the dog up and put it on the table and she's having a conversation with that little dog, right? If you go to any of these other scenes, you'll notice the same kind of missed glances. She looks at him, he looks off into the distance. She's looking at him, but he's not returning her look. This guy's looking at her. In fact, this kind of missed, uh, you know, this flirtation that doesn't have any, any resolution where people pair off seems to be the theme of this whole thing, as if people flirt and they get interested in someone, but it's all just play. And in the far back corner here, you actually see a woman who's been pushed to the edge of the canvas, right? She's, she's literally kind of um, cornered in the, the composition here. She's covering her ears while these two men get really closer. And this guy's even got his arms around her. Um, God knows what they're saying to her, but she doesn't seem to be wanting to hear it. So his social commentary, whatever you take from it, is about all of this flirtation and people kind of missing their opportunities or not being interested in the same person that's interested in them, but it's all fun and happy nonetheless. Um, you don't need to remember this work, but I wanted you to know that, um, that Renoir, um, pretty early on by the 1880s decided that, um, mid 1880s decided that impressionism was not really his cup of tea. He, like many of the painters that came after thought of the impressionists as a little bit too, um, superficial, that they weren't really um, following through on their ideas. I'll bring this up later when we get to post-impressionism. So he returned to the classical tradition to some degree and started painting one nude after another after another. Um, I tend to think he was doing it because he knew these things would sell. So for instance, in this work, preposterously called the bathers, as if women go out into rivers and get nude and kind of splash each other with water and so forth actually happens. Um, he's banking on males buying these, just as Aang was banking on males buying, for instance, the Turkish bath for much the same reason. Not that it should matter to you much at all, but besides Manet, who's not an Impressionist proper, my favorite of the Impressionist painters is Edgar Degas. Uh, Edgar Degas early in his career was really interested in Gustave Corbeau. He was a very, uh, Corbeau, sorry, a very close friend of uh, Edward Manet's. He didn't ever call himself an impressionist painter. He called himself a realist painter, which should tell you something. He actually started off his career with moody paintings such as this. It's a really early painting from 1868, 1870, um, called Interior the Rape. And what he's trying to get at, I think you can see, is that the feeling of foreboding, the feeling of something really uh, horrible that's just about to occur. In this really darkened scene, we see a woman off to the left-hand side in her bedclothes with, uh, you know, the strap falling off the shoulder, which is supposed to be provocative. It's pretty clearly not her own home because her suitcase is open on the table and she's either putting away or taking out clothing. Uh, while this man, who is totally kind of um, covered in the shadow, who looks 
incredibly menacing because he's made to look even taller by compositionally putting him right up near the frame of the painting that will make something look bigger with a little glint in his eye and looks totally comfortable she doesn't seem to be aware of him while he surveys her Edgar Degas' uh, work of the Impressionist period keeps getting more and more sketchy, and he's really interested not only in the atmospheric of, uh, effects of a particular time of day, he's also interested in social commentary, just like his friend Edward Manet. This is his work called The Absinthe Drinker from 1876. And what we're looking at is a work that's not so dissimilar than Edward Manet's The Plum. We've got a lower class woman, probably a prostitute or someone who at least prostituted herself part of the time, dressed in bon marché clothing with that look of ennui or social alienation on her face. Instead of having a plum soaked in brandy in front of her, she has one of the um, very common symbols of alienation during the time in front of her, a glass of absinthe. You can always recognize this because of its milky kind of greenish color. And absinthe during its own time period was seen, uh, first of all, you should know, it's a really high powered um, alcohol. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's an anisette, so it has a kind of licorice type flavor with lots of herbs in it. Um, but it's a, you know, it ranges from 120 to 160 proof, so it's serious stuff. But it also had some mythology around it, even during this time period, because it is actually made out of um, um, distilling um, alcohols through things like wormwood. Uh, people thought that it was also a hallucinogen, and it, it's probably not. But people got really drunk off it in order to escape you know, their everyday life or just to take pleasure in having a hard alcohol here. When it is put in front of someone of the lower classes, though, it's almost always supposed to be indicative of someone who's trying to escape the world in which they live, their actual reality. And that's what he's doing here, right? He's saying this woman doesn't like life. There's no other alternatives to her, so she's going to escape it. And what does that mean? What do we do about these things? Just like um, Manet in front of him, he opens the table so as to show you the place of, you know, her, her midsection. Um, this is her connection to the wider world through the sex trade. Next to her, her boyfriend or her pimp doesn't look like a particularly um, charismatic guy. You know, she's got nothing to look forward to there. Just like Manet, he's used those tables in order to create a barrier between her and the world around her, a symbol of alienation. But here's where things get kind of interesting. Look at those tables for a minute and notice how they don't make a lot of sense. Just like Edouard Manet's mirror in the bar at the Folie Berger doesn't quite look accurate. Why? Well, because they're not real tables, right? They're just painted tables. They don't have to be rational. They don't have to have legs that hold them up. These don't. Why? Again, they're not tables. And he doesn't want to have a, a vertical member here getting some kind of vertical element getting in the way of this passage of beautiful paint that he has used to paint her skirt. If we get up close on this, you can see that sketchy quality. And again, some people will say, wow, that's not very skillful. These guys couldn't paint. You know, those classical artists clearly had some skill. But what I want to say to you is that um, skill is something that anyone can develop over time. Yes, some people are born with more um, innate skill. They get better at things quicker. But if you take a number of painting classes or drawing classes, you can get remarkably better at creating likenesses pretty quick. And since those have been going on for hundreds of years by this point, you can imagine painters kind of getting bored with it and saying, what else is there? You can also imagine them saying, and this is key to modernism, what are the strengths of my particular medium painting? What can it do that other things can't, right? Well, photography can't do this. These beautiful passages of uh, calligraphic brushstrokes, these beautiful textures next to one another, I find this really uh, pleasing and um, and I'm not worried about the skill factor because I know how hard it is to do something like this that actually looks good. 
Edgar Degas, of course, is also famous for his ballet scenes. Um, the ballet scenes are, um, you know, they are what they are. Ballet dancers are beautiful. Um, obviously, um, picturing them would be a way that a lot of people could, well, Degas could make money because everyone's going to want to buy these up. But what a lot of people don't know about the ballet scenes is that what you're primarily looking at in a Degas work is a rehearsal not an actual performance. And one of the reasons that he does that is that a, a, something that he was interested in his entire career was the thematic of voyeurism, of being in a place where you could see something that other people couldn't see and the pleasure that comes from that. So the ballet's uh, rehearsals were always closed off from the general public unless you had an in. And one of the ways you could get an in is if you were a painter and knew someone, Another way to have an in was to be a sponsor, as they called it, for one of the young ballet dancers because training cost a boatload of money and most of the ballet dancers, not all, but most came from the lower classes, so they needed someone to help foot the bill for their training. Now, in exchange for this, a lot of those sponsors hung out in the, the ballet rehearsals and either just because they were kind of creepy old men uh, or because they had designs on the dancers and, and frankly we know that they, they had affairs with these dancers, they paid for their way in. So oftentimes in the background you'll see someone just hanging out here. It's not clear in this painting, which is um, just a, a work that's called the ballet rehearsal, if this guy is a, uh, one of the teachers or if he's one of the sponsors, but you'll see in a work coming up clear uh, sponsors just hanging out waiting for these dancers watching them uh, you know bending and turning and getting looks up their dresses and so forth being kind of creepy old dudes uh, and then perhaps taking some of these very young dancers home in order um, to get a return I guess on their investment. The other thing I want to say about Degas work that is really important is that he used photography a lot in order, to, um, in order to create his compositions. And one of the things that photography seems to have drawn painters' attention to is cropping and all of the abstract qualities that come when you crop a figure. So when you crop, for instance, the spiral staircase off to the side, instead of just being a spiral staircase, it becomes this beautiful kind of design element, right? Before this time period, you know, a painter wouldn't have cropped a figure off halfway through, um, you know, or at least they would, it would have been odd for them to do so. But he does this over and again to emphasize the design qualities of painting over the fact that it is just a ballet dancer. The other reason he does this has to do with fetishism again, which you will have read a bunch about in your reserve reading. Cutting off dancers' legs with Manet did a lot of too in his own work that I didn't show you is because Ballet dancers' legs were a fetish, by which we mean something that, you know, turned people on, right? Something that they got really excited about. But the other component of a fetish is that it is a, a way to objectify something. A fetish is something, for instance, a part body or parts of a leg that separates the thing that is the sexual fetish from the actual human being. So just like all these conversations I've been having with you, about the female nude, fetishizing or objectifying female bodies. Another way that that's done is by cropping bodies, showing you body parts such as legs. Next time you look at advertising, notice how often this is done, that they will crop a woman's body off just to show lips or to show an eye or to show you know cleavage or what have you, but not show you the rest of the human being. It's a way to objectify these forms. This is a work that is called um, Ballet Scene from an Opera Box. It's a pastel work. Um, Degas worked in pastels as well. And it's the same idea, right? You're seeing a ballet, probably actual performance this time, one of the very few ones, from an opera box next to your partner in the opera box, this woman with her fan open. And he's basically abstracted the form of ballet dancers into these beautiful passages of pastel colors and textures and what have you. And he even did this with sculpture. Although I'm not going to talk about this, you'll probably come across this. If you ever travel the world, there are many copies of his little ballet dancer, 14 years old, which is the ultimate fetish in a way. 
It's a, a very large, well, not quite full size, 24 inches or so sculpture that originally had its own hair, its own sewn uh, dress and tutu and so forth, even its own little shoes. A cool part about Impressionism, because it's outside of the Royal Academy, is that women participated in it like never before. Um, two of the most important artists of the Impressionist movement, Mary Cassatt and Berta Morisot, um, could show their works without having to, uh, for instance, get the training of classical artists, which would have cost a boatload, or as I said before in this class, many women artists could never compete in the classical tradition with the male artists because they weren't allowed to study from the male nude in particular, which was essential to being a classical artist. And also, frankly, because the Impressionist painters, or at least many of them, really um, were supportive of women artists. Um, Mary Cassatt, who is American born, uh, actually trained for a brief time at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts in the United States and then moved to Paris, was supported by Edward and Eugene Manet uh, and by Edgar Degas and many others and became the most shown, exhibited and sold artist of the Impressionist artist during her own time period. She, however, like many of these women, did not have access to the public realm the same way men did. And so most of the scenes of the Impressionist women artists are the world that they saw. One of the worlds that they saw over and again was the opera. The opera was a place, just as it is today, in which you go to see beautiful art, but you're also going there, frankly, for a social purpose, right? You're going there to dress up, um, if you're a young woman, you're going there so people can see how beautiful you are or to meet possible male suitors. It's one of the very few public venues in which young, unattached women and men interacted because you couldn't just do it on the street. You couldn't, like today, you know, call someone up or just drop by their house. The, those were things that were against the social norms. So going to an opera was a place to, to see the world and to be seen in return. And it's one of the few places that, frankly, women could play the role of the flaneur in a way. They couldn't wander the streets. So this work, what you're seeing here, which sometimes is called At the Opera, sometimes it's called Women in Black at the Opera, is about not the artistry of going to the opera, but the, the fact that the opera is a place to go check people out and to be checked out in return. In the foreground, we see a woman who's dressed all in black. This is usually, but not always, symbolic of what were called Amazon women. And that's not a good term, by the way. That means an independent woman who is breaking, she's very modern, she's breaking the rules of society. She may be that, or she just may be dressed in her black kind of, um, you know, fashionable clothes. Her opera glasses are looking out from a loge, which is an opera box, across the way and not trained down on the stage itself, right? And while she's checking people out rather than watching what's going on on the stage, other people are checking her out too. Here's a guy off in another loge with his opera glasses checking her out too. So it's a commentary on the social interactions of the opera box. But it's also painted in that Impressionist style, right? Drawing attention to the beautiful passages of this incredibly luminous yellow against the reds, very warm, expansive colors against the cools of the black. And this is cool, that these scenes uh, are just kind of squiggle marks, right? So actually, let me go back here. If I get in close on this, I'm just gonna bring you in close on this guy. He's not a fully rendered figure at all. He's just a squiggle passage of paint, right? But her eye recognizes him as a figure. That's her following Monet's example, the paint, what your naive eye sees. Now, the Impressionist painters as well, or Mary Cassatt as well, will be painting scenes that are social commentaries on the experience of women in these venues. So here I'm juxtaposing two paintings by Mary Cassatt. The work on the right is called, usually called Lydia in a Loge wearing a pearl necklace, sometimes now called Woman in a Loge wearing a pearl, 
pearl necklace because we're not sure if it's Lydia. Lydia was her sister. And on the left hand side is just called the Loge. Now take a minute to look at this and just like the work by Kaibach, you'll notice that the artist has manipulated colors and shapes and space in order to say something or express something about the experience of women in these venues. And what I mean by that is if you look at Lydia over here, and if it is Lydia, by the way, Lydia, you should know, was dying of a disease. And um, we know that on one of the last uh, kind of social outings of her life, a family friend who is very rich loaned her a pearl necklace to go out on the town and to, you know, enjoy herself. And she was really, really happy on that night. May have to do with that. Here she is in this loge, and if you can't read this in both scenes, there's a mirror behind the opera box seating. So you're seeing behind her actually what is in front of her. And in this scene, everything is red, right, and yellow, warm colors, expansive colors, colors that are inviting to us. She's smiling with an open mouth, and you wouldn't know this, of course, but in the 19th century, Women were not supposed to smile with open mouths. That's really, really flirtatious. It's like today seeing a bra over a bedpost or something. It's a grand invitation. Because of the color differentiation between her dress and her skin, you get to see lots of skin here and she leans into us. The uh, fan here at her lap even kind of draws us into her midsection there. And she's open to us. It feels like we can enter into the scene and interact with her. So in a way, this is a woman acting in a way that is a little bit sexually provocative, probably according to the mores, social mores of the time, a little bit too outgoing um, for what is expected. Whereas on the left-hand side, you see women acting, probably young women acting the way that they're supposed to act. Very sedate, very... Um, kind of, you know, their, their posture is very stiff here. They're not smiling in the same way. They're demure is what, is what they would have said at the time. The fan is up over the face of one of the characters and so forth. The colors are cool, so they're contracting and receding from us. This is probably the way that women were expected to act at this social event of the opera in order to, uh, you know, get the right kind of guy interested in them versus the one on the right, which is a little bit more outgoing. And then of course, um, I'm not showing you a ton of these, but you should be aware that there are hundreds of these types of pictures, paintings by Mary Cassatt and Berta Morisot of something that had never entered the realm of art before this, or at least in no grand scale. And that's scenes of the domestic life of women and children. Before this time, if you were a classical painter, of course, subject matter has to be grand. Who would waste their time on a mother and a child unless it was Jesus and, you know, the Virgin Mary? These women who had access to this realm all the time, who are really intimately aware of the social interactions of women and children, because these women are their friends and what, this is what they know, chose this as their subject matter and they nail it, right? They get it right over and over again. Here is this you know, young mother with her beautiful young child. Um, she's lying in bed. She adores this ch child, but boy, is she tired, right? Um, just like any, uh, I'm sure, an experience any mother recognizes fully. Or, the bath here by Cassatt. This is, um, even today, uh, water is kind of scarcer in Europe and in France. I, I lived there for uh, quite a while. Um, you know, bathing is not necessarily a daily affair, or if you bathe, you bathe in a tub really quickly with small amounts of water and uh, go on with your day. Here's this mother giving this young girl her bath, washing off her feet in this totally intimate moment that we get to witness here. We're standing up above looking down and maybe we're presumed to be the father who isn't a part of this really essential relationship between mother and child because in the 19th century it was primarily mothers and children um, that had that bond and the father was out in the world doing his own thing. Also though social commentary um, these are two paintings on the 
Left hand side is a work called Le Figaro or Cassatt's mother reading Le Figaro and on the right is woman reading. You see the point of this work at least in the way that I want you to think about it is over and over again Mary Cassatt would represent young women doing the things that they would do um, you know in the home and that meant learning to sew learning to play a little bit of the piano and reading books but the books that they read are almost always these little books that would have been kind of like cheap fiction books um, just ways to pass the day in fantasy reading a newspaper though which is the realm of the public which is always understood during the 19th century to be the realm of men after all women don't have the right to vote they don't have the right to divorce their husbands on their own grounds. They don't have the right to property if they devote, uh, if they divorce and so forth. Um, you know, it's a really structured world where the public realm is that of men and newspapers are associated with that. And the private realm and the realm of fantasy is the realm of women. So she shows this. Commonly, women will be reading books over and over again. But her mother, who comes from Pennsylvania and is the American in Paris and doesn't want to play by the rules, is reading Le Figaro, a newspaper that's kind of like the New York Times or something. And it's her way of making a commentary on some early emergent um, contestations of these divisions between the sexes. Because since the time of the revolution, women have been arguing for some basic rights and not getting them. In fact, in, in France, they won't even get the right to vote until after World War II, but they are agitating for that change. Finally, just very briefly, two works by Berta Morisot here. Berta Morisot was an amateur painter, meaning she never devoted her full time to painting because she wanted to be a mother. And for whatever reason during the 19th century, to be a grand artist, to be a great painter, meant you had to devote all of your time to it. You couldn't be a mother and a painter, they thought. And she thought that too. And so she decided she'd just be an amateur painter. She actually married the brother of Edouard Manet, Eugene Manet. And here you see a scene of that mother with her child. Very intimate scene, um, kind of common to her work. Or... Very briefly, another work by Berta Morso called The Dining Room of a beautiful woman in her abode, in her dining room, preparing dinner. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. There are, of course, many, many more Impressionist painters, but this should give you um, at least enough foundation that when you see those other painters work, you have a way to interact with them and think about them. See you next week.